meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board here on March 6, 2018. Uh, would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Ms. Augles? Here. Ms. Saunders? Here. Ms. Hendrickson? Here. And I see Mr. Duperry and Mr. Bealey are absent this evening. Thank so you. In that regards, then that makes Ms. Hendrickson a voting member. Is he going to be voting? If, uh, should we get to that point? Oh. Potentially. Not sure if you will or you won't, but it's within the realm of possibility. So the only action item on our agenda this evening uh, is a workshop uh, for Crossroads Holdings, LLC, uh, requesting a conceptual master plan, phase one, for Scarborough Downs, Assessor's Map, R52, Lot 4. And I will let Jay briefly intro this. Sure. As you noted, this is really uh, sort of a, a unique meeting for this board, and we felt that sort of doing more of a, a workshop-style discussion would be um, more conducive to having an open dialogue and conversation uh, where we are talking about 500 acres in the middle of town. Um, you know, it's worth sort of having more open dialogue, open discussion, rather than sort of the board's typical activity of sort of standing or sitting up at the dais, sitting in, in uh, sort of strict judgment role. Here is really conversational. Um, and that's really what the zoning recognizes. We talked about this a little bit at site inventory, how the zoning really anticipates this being a collaborative process between the town and the developer moving forward. Um, so just quickly, I'll touch on where we are at in the review process and then, um, and then kick it over uh, back to you, Mr. Chair. But um, as I noted, um, we are talking about Scarborough Downs. This is in the Crossroad Plan Development District, which requires a, a multi-step process for review. The board has previously conducted its site inventory and analysis of the entire site. Um, all 500 acres, which also included a conceptual infrastructure plan component. Um, the applicants before you, um, the sort of formal activity is for a master plan of phase one of development, really the first 50 acres closest to Route 1, where they're looking at some residential components that's really part of the major part of the packet. Um, and part of the board's charge as, as reviewing those that first phase, that first mas um, that master plan for that first phase, I guess is the way I should say it. Really, there's three things the board needs to be mindful of. It's finding that that phase is consistent with the site inventory analysis, that the phase is consistent with the plan development standards of the um, CPD district, and that it's consistent with the space and bulk standards of the CPD district. And that's something we're going to talk a bit about tonight. Um, the space and bulk standards are, are really wide open. Uh, but for height and impervious coverage, <coughs> excuse me, so a typical lot size, frontage, setbacks are really left for, for this type of discussion. As I say that, that's sort of the, the specifics of the review of the phase one master plan. I think what would be helpful to do is to start the conversation is really looking at the entire parcel, sort of zooming out, um, understanding sort of the context of all 500 acres, and then we can really start to drill into the, the, the sort of formal review process, if you will, of those 50 acres. Um, so I think with that, you know, you will have received our staff comments that spells out a lot of that, but um, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Jay, and I'll just add a couple quick housekeeping notes. One, um, we want to try to, when we were setting this up, we agreed we wanted to try to, try to make this about a 90-minute meeting, uh, try to get folks uh, folks on their way and hopefully focus the conversation and uh, I think one of the benefits of breaking it out like this in kind of a workshop setting is that we're not kind of embedded within a bigger planning board agenda and we can really drill down on some of these things hopefully that'll work out for everybody um, secondly we will have the opportunity for public comment once the applicant has made their presentation and then we'll get into uh, board discussion so with that I will turn it over to uh, Dan or whoever's your I'll jump in, presentation, <laughs> if I might. Rocky right. Ridge Barrow. Jump in. Uh, 
Crossroads Holdings LLC. Uh, just want to say I really appreciate uh, the board getting together tonight and having a special meeting for us. I think it's it's important uh, to be able to really spend some focused time on this. And I know the board's agendas have been very heavy. Uh, I think I personally stood in front of you for an hour and a half at the last meeting. And <laughs> probably an hour and a half is about good. That, that's enough. That's, that's, uh, that's but we really appreciate you, you know, you, you having us here tonight. Uh, I do have Dan Bacon and uh, Lucas Anthony here from Goro Palma and uh, Nick Aceto, uh, who's doing all of our landscape architecture work. So it's part of the team. Uh, and uh, Dan's got a, a presentation for you, and I think we just flip it over to him and, and have him uh, get started. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, and, and thanks again for having a special workshop for us, and we'll try to stick to that 90-minute um, benchmark. Um, so I'm going to kind of jump right in. And we jump right in. Yeah, here we go. Um, so as Jay outlined, there's a number of things we want to cover this evening. Um, first and foremost, we do want to start with kind of the bigger picture vision and master plan for the entire property. And, and we were thinking it would be, you know, consistent with a workshop type format. I'd love to kind of present that bigger picture master plan and then open it up for comments and get some feedback from the board and questions and then proceed on. So I'm not up here for, for 60 of those 90 minutes kind of just talking at you or, or to you. So we would do that first. I just want to talk about, two sort of the phasing and the plan development review process that Jay started to outline, um, just so the board's clear on the, the steps. And coupled with that, I think it's really important to talk about other permitting. This is a really big project. Um, it's going to touch other agencies. So we'll quickly touch on DEP thresholds when they're triggered, um, main DOT, and Army Corps of Engineers, just to put it in context in terms of where we are and where we're headed. Um, and, the, and the final couple items and really the meat of what we're going to be reviewing is really the design goals for this phase one master plan and the zoning standards that we're, we're proposing to achieve those goals. And, and we want to have um, conversations about that, get your review, and um, we want to kind of position ourselves for if you're comfortable um, with approval of the phase one master plan and then the next steps of course would be subdivision and, and site plan review which we've come back in for pieces of that that phase one so um, this is a slide out of uh, I think the, the chair <laughs> gave us this good idea uh, a month or two ago and you know we really want to kind of put the size of Scarborough Downs into context and so we did this exercise we showed it to I think the council and, and set out over the past couple of weeks and it, it sort of says a lot for I think the magnitude of this project the significance of it and also um, kind of the variety over time that could be within the Scarborough Downs project so what this is showing is uh, the property boundaries, more or less, of Scarborough Downs, the, the 500 acres, and it's actually, it's placed, the scale of the Downs has been placed on, on three different areas. One, the one to the left is actually Freeport, um, and in the core there is L.L. Bean and, and the core, the downtown area of Freeport, and just kind of gives you a sense for, <coughs> for scale where, you know, the sort of walkable Freeport fits within maybe a fifth of the size of the Downs property and it also shows the neighborhoods and other areas and conservation land um, in Freeport that's, that would fit within the Downs. So just to give a, a sense of scale, that's, that's Freeport. The middle slide is Mashby Commons, which is on, on Cape Cod, and uh, that may sound arbitrary, but Mashby Commons is a kind of a planned downtown um, that's <coughs> evolved over the past 20 or so years. And it has some of the elements that, that we've been thinking about in terms of what could happen in the core of the downs. It may not happen exactly like this in terms of retail being the, the catalyst, given where retail's at right now. Um, but it gives you a sense for kind of a walkable uh, center that we, we really want to achieve over time. And also a sense of scale. That's maybe a, a tenth of the size of the downs. Um, and the third one, and the one to the right, we think is equally kind of interesting and fun to, to think about. That's the Portland Peninsula, and it's 
um, a good, I don't know, maybe 75% of the Portland Peninsula um, is roughly, you know, would fit within the Downs, uh, maybe 50%. But it shows that there's the East End, there's, um, there's Congress Street and, and much of the downtown, even down to Bayside, you know, uh, geographically would fit within the, the limits of the Downs. So we hope this kind of frames kind of what we're talking about and, and gives a reference point in terms of scale. And also staying sort of at that at high level with this master plan, um, we can we see our goals for the project being very much in common with the towns in terms of where you're at with your comprehensive planning process and zoning, and and where we're headed with our vision for this project. We really want it to be a mixed use kind of very livable community that can have a mix of commercial, uh, residential, and, and civic type uses. Uh, within the project in various <coughs> neighborhoods and various areas. Um, we've thought a lot about the walkability and the bikeability, kind of the complete streets potential of the project that we talked about at the CIP stage with you. Like with the um, infrastructure plan, we want it to be connected and integrated within the project, but also to what's happening around the project. Um, and in terms of housing, um, and this is reflected in our phase one master plan, we want it to be a mixed housing project and multi-generational to have um, some housing for young professionals, families, um, uh, seniors, and, and everything in between. So we're interested in that kind of holistic housing approach. Like the property has been for decades, we're hoping that it remains uh, having a recreational entertainment type hub. Um, we don't know the future of the downs and the racetrack, um, and that's something we're learning more about, as I think Brock, you'll kind of comment maybe late in the meeting, we're learning about that business to a degree. Um, but if it does transition, we're hopeful that the core of the property is kind of has a recreation entertainment focus and can be a catalyst for the project and a special place for the community to, to come together. Um, in terms of commercial development, it's important to us, and I think it's important uh, for the town to have a diverse commercial tax base that could come out of this project, and we have some ideas in different areas for that. And um, sort of the, the ROI is pretty critical to this project uh, in terms of stimulating enough investment to run the infrastructure, to make it a reality, and make sure it's a fiscally sustainable project. Also, we're quite interested in and required under the zoning to be knitting together open space networks and greenways, and I've thought a lot about how that can come together on the master plan level, and um, all with the eyes on kind of creating kind of that mixed use core uh, in the center of the project ultimately. So at the master plan level, um, we've broken the property really into kind of five different areas and, and we'll talk about the southerly area in more detail later on. Um, and we're trying to shape these areas and define them by character to a degree or kind of land uses and, and character, the kind of the, the setting that could evolve in the various areas of the project. Um, so the area closer to Route 1 and what we're going to talk about in more detail, we see as phase one, and we've applied for as phase one, and we think it's really, a, and are proposing it as a, primarily a residential phase with a mix of different housing types that we'll talk about in more detail. We see some light commercial in this phase, and we want it to be compact and walkable and bikeable, um, having a mix of some small commons that are kind of active spaces that development's focused around, but also a fair amount of open space and wetland conservation. Um, and we see this as an important early step in the project to create some activity, to have people living in the, in the property and, and um, creating some kind of vitality that can lead to commercial <coughs> development in the core. We also see it as a new kind of southern gateway from Route 1, and we were thinking a lot about how do we redefine the Route 1 entrance and, and make it a, uh, a new look and feel to uh, this property that's been um, in town for a long time. 
So jumping way up to the other end of the project, this area is up by Payne Road. And um, it's sort of the northerly section of the project. And we see this as potentially a phase two. Um, we would come back to you potentially, you know, could be soon for a master plan review for this area. And we see this area as really more of a commercial, non-residential uh, development area. The logistics are really good on Payne Road. It has good access to um, exit 42 and the highway to Payne Road. It has some good visibility for commercial and non-residential development. We think there is great opportunity for some employment uh, here. And this is an area, too, that has good access, um, like I said, but also it can be designed in a way that's separate from the rest of the project. We anticipate some residential potentially close to this area, but Nick's been looking closely at, okay, how do we, how do we buffer this area? How do we make this be a self-sufficient kind of commercial non-residential area that is connected but is is somewhat isolated and buffered from the rest of the project. So we'd like to consider that further at the next master plan stage with the board. So the southerly kind of central area, this is really the area around the current grandstands in the in the track. And you know this in the in the next kind of central central zone. This is where we see in the mid-range um, really uh, really kind of the heart of the project. This is where there could be kind of that town center uh, type development where there there could be the track that's updated and, and reinvigorated or it's retrofitted or the grandstands become a different use and maybe that grandstand building can be preserved and repurposed. Um, and so those are decisions we need to make over the next year or two. Um, but regardless, we see sort of the track, its geometry, uh, the grandstands potentially really being kind of a landmark and focal point in the center, and that there be commercial and mixed-use development that happens around it. Again, hoping that it's in focusing on it as maybe a recreational hub where there could be some athletic uh, accommodate, you know, some field, some indoor-outdoor sports venues. Um, we've talked, started having conversations about the potential for a community center or something like that that can be a, a real amenity for the project, but just as importantly for the, for the town and a, and a uh, destination within this project. Staying in the same general vicinity, just moving north um, and west a little bit, uh, again, we see this being kind of that mixed use hub of the project. Um, and this is an area that as you kind of head closer to Haigas Parkway or the road connects to Haigas Parkway, there's some retail potential. Um, and it could be sort of a shopping center type development on the edge, um, but in very close proximity, in close proximity to some, some office, some hotel, some mixed use and some retail that's um, right in the heart of the project. And, and we thought a lot about kind of creating a place or multiple places within this area, uh, having a central commons or square to organize development around. And this will take time, um, but we want the framework to be established early on so that we're building toward this vision and not, um, and not kind of squandering the opportunity as we work our way towards, towards the central core. Uh, lastly, um, the area more to the east, and this would be kind of south of that Payne Road, northerly pod, and to the, to the northeast of the, to the center, um, we see is really where the stables are today um, on the project and, and north of there. We see that area uh, in the overall master plan of being really more of a mixed housing area. And it could be, there's a fair amount of property here in acreage, so it could be a a number of different type of neighborhoods with a mix of housing uh, that could have some some family type housing, um, some senior type housing, and as well as sort of multifamily type housing. And we've laid it out in a, a grid system uh, with opportunities for pocket parks and and um, stormwater facilities and, and really kind of a just 
a grid network to distribute traffic and, and have the neighborhoods connect together in a, in a logical way. Um, so these are our initial ideas and we thought it was important to have an overall master plan that then helps us focus on how the first phase plugs into the rest. Um, so we're not ready to commit to every road alignment here and every uh, land use in every location, but this is helps give us kind of structure and definition as to how we um, incrementally to develop the property. We hope it kind of helps frame the bigger picture for the board. And then, then we can zoom into to the phase one details, which is the, really the matter before you this evening. So I'm going to stop there and welcome feedback and comments and questions before we continue on. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'll open it up at this point to uh, any public comment. Folks have any questions or comments at this point? Feel free to come on up and introduce yourself. Will there be opportunities later on to speak? Yes. Yep. We're trying to kind of break it down into bite-sized pieces, I think. So, Dan, um, thanks for that <coughs> overview. Is it fair to say, and I know there's been some discussion about this in various venues um, in terms of the phasing and the general timing, mm -hmm. is it generally fair to say that the, the, the overall thinking here is still to kind of work kind of from the outside in? Obviously, you've mentioned, you know, phase one would be that southerly area, possibly phase two to the north. Is that still generally, generally accurate? Yeah, it is, and, and the rest of the team should jump in as, as we go. Um, the, here we go. The thinking is, obviously, phase one is, there's a lot of screens to choose from. <laughs> as to which one to do, so. That's the only one that's going to work on. I'm going to go with that's going to work on. Okay, good. It's also the biggest one. Um, this is phase one, and we'll talk about that master plan down by route one. So this would be the initial phase. We're thinking that up along Payne Road is likely to be phase two. Um, and coming off of Hyagas Parkway could be phase three, but the, or vice versa, but the goal is to work in from the three edges mm -hmm. and where the project meets Payne Road, Hyagas Parkway, Route 1 as main roads. And that's where the infrastructure is today that can serve the project. Beyond its roads, it's sewer, water, electric. Um, you know, and the, and the the road network and utility network is really framed by, you know, this road is a bit of a loop road connection from Payne Road to Hygus Parkway. It's a little bit aligned, a little bit different than what we showed at the CIP. It's more or less the same alignment, but it's been adjusted so that this is a kind of straight road connection with the Route 1 connection kind of coming up and teeing into it, uh, thinking that we want to connect the two probably more commercially focused areas and then have the residential in the, in the core kind of tee into that road. I mean, they're all going to be main roads and all going to be collectors, but um, that could, there could be more kind of traffic movement that connects Payne to Highgus potentially than necessarily Route 1 to Payne, at least in a manner that is at higher speed. We, we want to slow traffic down. We want it to be more circuitous getting through the project, particularly from Route 1 and through kind of the neighborhood sections of the project. Um, so our goal would be to, in the early phases of the project, kind of create this road and infrastructure framework from which the, the local roads and other phases um, feed off of. Thanks. Corey, can I just add by ask a question? Go ahead. Uh, so one of the, uh, just sort of wondering what, as I sort of look at this and think about the connection to the, the neighborhood in general, I mean, obviously, Route 1, we have a great deal of capacity. We have four lanes of traffic in both directions. Hygis Parkway is nice wide, 60-foot uh, wide right away out there with lots of room. It seems like the biggest challenge in terms of access could be potentially looking at improvements along Payne Road. And I'm just wondering what type of thoughts, considerations have you have you seen in looking at that? Am I off base? Do you see other challenges that are out there? Um, just maybe start to set the stage a little bit anyway. I know you sure. probably don't have all the answers yet, but. We see for initial development within that northerly Payne Road area, um, the intersection likely being suitable. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we're still analyzing what is that tipping point in that first pod that's going to necess necessitate additional improvements. Um, but there's a fair amount of capacity at that intersection in terms of getting in and out of the downs. Because we're a lot talking going about on. That, that's the Holmes Road intersection, right? Mm -hmm. Holmes and Holmes Payne. And Payne and Bridge. Yeah, just to give yeah. context. Because mm -hmm. there's a there's a left turn yeah. lane in off of Payne going yep. southbound. There's a right turn lane in going northbound on Payne. So there's a certain amount of phase. We'll call it phase two. A development in this area that can occur without offsites, um, but we need to analyze what is that tipping point, and we're in the process of that. Um, at Haggis Parkway, there would need to be a new intersection, and um, you know, if that inter intersection improvements are going to be made, we want to make a meaningful initial one so that it's it's not piecemealed. Um, so. You know, we're in the process right now of doing trip generation calculations for each character zone or pod of development, which then can inform, you know, short, medium, longer term intersection improvements. Along I'm that sure we'll have other questions, but sorry. Oh, Is it okay? Um, along the same lines, uh, what's the feedback from the Scarborough Sanitary District as far as? Providing if, if phase one is going to be mostly resi mixed residential kind of a thing, have they provided feedback on a timeline that meets yours? I can, I can address that. We, we had an initial meeting with the sanitary district, uh, with the, the board of trustees the other night. We met with Dave Hughes uh, at, down at his office and just started to, to talk about it. Uh, I think the gut feeling is at this point that this, they've, they've got some capacity there. Okay. Uh, we haven't given them enough information to really win mastering yet. Our meeting with the trustees was just to introduce the project and, and just talk about you know, where we were headed with it. So certainly we'll have to be some, some numbers run and calculations made to figure out what they've got for capacity. So it's not just capacity, but I think it's the lateral lines. And, and what, I'm, what I'm wondering about too is, um, and remind me, is maybe staff can remind me too, is there sewer out on that side of Payne Road? Because I know we've had some discussions about Payne Road not being sewered past a certain extent. So mm -hmm. are we sewered on Payne Road? So I can, I can touch on, on that. There's, there's some sewer in Payne Road. It doesn't come, uh, actually, I can point to it with my, my point here. Right. It comes up just, just before our property. It's about right in here, right? It's right about it. It is, yeah. Yep. So, so that's just about where Gin Road would it's be? It's about where Gin Road yeah. is. So to be honest with you, we haven't figured this piece out yet. You know, the down here, this was first for us. This we're just really starting to work on. We do know that in Route 1, we have, uh, we have sewer and we've got good capacity. We've got good, you know, good sized lines. We know we did look at and talked about uh, Sawyer Road. Sawyer Road has some capacity, but probably not. You know, not going to drink a lot uh, off off Sawyer Road if, if we needed to. Um, although I don't think you know we we know that there's capacity within this enterprise <coughs> business park, and we have uh, we have a couple of connection points uh, that we've got access to. So we're we're working on it. I guess is the. Okay. So we're not going to have to worry about a number of successive or sequential uh, septic systems. Where we're, the goal is to move into public sewer. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. public sewer. The project yes. would be entirely served by sewer. Okay. So that's a little bit challenging because it is mm -hmm. not really on the property at this point. Mm -hmm. It's 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 kind of all around us. So, and Robin, for phase one, we have some plans later on though. And show how that show you something. can be tied in because that that may be yeah. served differently than the core. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then the surface, are you planning to, as far as surface runoff, are you thinking curb and gutter type type uh, development, or are you thinking uh, try to incorporate some low impact development where you treat treat the runoff at the site and provide discrete stormwater improvements, or are you trying to go for a big detention pond? For um, specifically for phase, phase one. one, we are looking at more of a distributed kind of localized system rather than just one big pond. Okay. Um, so we're looking at low impact designs, vegetated mm -hmm. under drains, okay. maybe some proprietary systems, you know, that type of thing that really, in the way pod one's broken up by some of the wetland fingers, 
it, it's a good way to do it. Right. It saves us some effort in trying to pipe from one pod to the other. And as far as the street, the civil design is concerned, will it be curb and gutter with catch basins, or are you trying to keep it on the surface with drains, open channel drains and, and the like, or are you talking about subsurface drainage? Not, not to be vague, but it depends on the product, I think, in, uh, in phase one, for example, we have a, a multifamily mm -hmm. pod. In there, it'll probably be curb and gutter. Mm -hmm. um, from there, we transition over to a single family neighborhood where we think that won't be curb and gutter, it'll be more surface drainage. Just understand that curb and gutter, I think, goes against the localized treatment kind of a thing. So so just think about if, you, if localized is what you want to do. To curb and gutter it and then send it to one central location does go against that low impact sort of development, which I think is fabulous that you're trying to do with, with the rest of the, the stormwater, the, the drainage and, and the like kind sure. of thing. That's good input. Thanks. Yeah. Do you have anything else now, Robin? Or? Oh, I have plenty, but I want to give others <laughs> time to talk. <laughs> All right, we'll spread it around. Okay. Rachel? Um, I've been... I, I was struck by a couple of things as I, I saw how you're how you're looking at the housing areas and it looks like for phase one it's primarily multifamily. Are you could be talking apartments, duplexes, townhouses. So for phase one, uh, we would be looking at um, condominiums. Uh, we have a section of, of condominiums, a couple of different types of condominiums, but mostly condominium. Uh, usage there. We do have uh, an area where we would be proposing some apartments, uh, and then we have an area where we would be proposing some single-family house lots. Okay, so and, then, about, and then you talk next. about, uh, I think, phase, phase uh, the easterly phase, um, housing choices and diversity. What's, so what's the distinction there? That, um, so in that area, we're, we're thinking, we really don't, we think it's a little further out. We really don't yeah, well, I, I know we're talking you know, 15 years. But, <laughs> but it could be, you know, it, it could be some traditional type housing. It, it could be, you know, we may have a, a, you know, a community that's geared towards elderly use, uh, that type of, of community. Uh, we're really not sure what, you know, what that could be, but we do see it probably more as housing uh, of some type. We also, right now we're thinking of it as kind of feathering out from the center. So that easterly residential area, we would anticipate, you know, if the, if the core becomes kind of an active commercial mixed use area with various des recreational destinations and employment, then maybe it would be kind of townhouses or multifamily closer to the commercial and then it transition out towards um, lower density housing. And that's um, a way to kind of structure that and that could be the same up towards the northerly area. Um, and there's a fair amount of room there. So we see kind of opportunities for multiple neighborhoods. It could be entirely kind of senior focused area, like a senior retirement community within, within just one aspect of that. Um, the last time I each time I've, I've heard, the, heard you talk about the, the development here, um, I've been struck by the fact that we constantly refer to this as, as a community with, with neighborhoods. And I was wondering if somebody could tell me what you, what you mean when you hear the word community. What defines a community for you? And what defines a neighborhood? One of the things I, I said from the beginning is this first phase really sets the tone for the rest of the development. And it's going to knock the socks off of everybody who looks at it to say, yeah, let's keep going. This is what we want. And it seems to me the concept of community and neighborhood is very important. And I think we need to understand what your vision is. What is a community? What's a neighborhood? Well, I think this is a, it's, a, it's going to be a community within a community. It's, it's certainly it's geographically, but it's the center of the town. I do think it's it's where we can end up with some of the things that I hear uh, that that a lot of the citizens of the town want, such as fields and sports complexes, and maybe some restaurants and some shopping opportunity, some uh, you know general office type use. We think that that all fits in the middle, and then in you know in the outer outskirts, if you will, 
maybe that's where our housing is. And certainly in our first phase that we're proposing, uh, a mix of housing types that, that would you know, feed that uh, commercial space that, that will come as we get, we get rooftops and we get users. So it's we kind of looked at phase one as you know, we know we need rooftops. We know that um, phase one is, is uh, it's a little bit cut up with the way the wetlands lay out in there. You have to work around, so there's no, it's not a good place if you had just like one big user or, or that sort of thing. So it felt good to us to, to have the, the residential type use there. And we think we're trying to hit some different markets that we feel are, are not being met right now with price points and types of housing. And that's why we're proposing like what? You know, some condominiums, a couple different styles of condominiums, some condominiums that might appeal to uh, maybe millennials, that their you know, price point might be a little, a little on the lower side than what you can typically buy in Scarborough. And then we want to have some condominiums that are going to appeal towards uh, maybe some older folks. It'll be a little larger in size. They'll have a, you know, probably single, have a single floor. Single mm -hmm. floor. You know, some will have two car garage, some will have a single car garage. But try to appeal to that. We don't think that we need to age restrict it, um, but it will appeal to the, that segment of the market. And then with our apartments, we know that we're, you know, our experiences with our apartments, we're hitting a wide section of the market. We've got some young folks there, and we've got some really older folks. It's a wide, wide cross section, um, and some people stay for a long time and some you know some it's a, kind of a jumping off point but then we move into the area where we have single family homes and those lot sizes are going to vary so the homes are probably going to be you know in a you know they're going to average around 1500 square feet some will be a little smaller some might be a little bigger but we really don't have any lots that we're going to have these you know half million dollar mansions on we don't we don't see that as a need right now and we don't we don't see that as a fit in this phase i think there are phases in the future we may have some larger houses. We may have some, you know, some higher end houses, some larger houses, because uh, you know there is a demand for that. But we feel that that uh, smaller is, is really where the market is right now. So we're trying to try to roll with with that at this point. I think you're really hitting at something that that I hear, um, which is that Scarborough doesn't have housing stock for the people who work in town, like the teachers. Uh, and the police and the firefighters, the, the town workers, um, they have to move out. They, the, the housing is such that they can't afford it, especially not somebody who's beginning as, as a teacher. So what you're addressing there, mm -hmm. I think really does meet the needs of, of people who want to live and work in mm -hmm. Scarborough. So I appreciate that. Um, I also um, hope that we're going to look at some diversity within the neighborhood. I've, I've lived in a lot of, of neighborhoods, some that, that were really planned, some that, that grew up. Uh, and one of the things that made an actual neighborhood was a place where people had their own house with some diversity and appearance to it. So they weren't. Sh they, they knew which house they were going in. I, I vividly remember walking into the wrong apartment building once when I was tired on my way home from teaching, um, because they all looked exactly alike. The uh, so a, a type of diversity built into a neighborhood, but with the common opportunity for people to meet and talk, mm -hmm. whether they're sitting out on their front porch uh, or they're at a, a pocket park. Well, there's a trail that they can walk to get from one place to the other. But something where they drive in and they say, this is my home community. And all of these people here are my neighbors. And you don't always get that when you have a brand new development. But I think with careful thought, you can design the, the buildings and the, um, and the landscaping such that people get that sense of home when they come in. And, and I think a, a development from the get-go that says to people, I'm home, mm -hmm. that that's what's going to draw more and more people in. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope you, that's something that's certainly something at. that we thought of. And I mean, we think that, you know, if this thing is done right, I mean, people can live here and maybe not really need to leave. They could get the services or most of the services they need right within the development in, in time. Um, and, Know, it's a community, yet it's also set up that other people that live in town, there are reasons to be there. And 
uh, I think of a community center is, is something we're really interested in. I know the town's interested in one. We're going to try to figure out how to get that done, uh, too, because we, we see a, a great need for it. Okay, thank you. Susan? I'm sitting here thinking as a planning board member, what am I going to get? Am I going to get full? When, when you come to talk, let's, let's assume we're going to do a southerly character zone as number one in front of us. So we would get <clears throat> a packet for this whole, which would include where the mixed housing is going to go, where the multi-generational housing is going to go, where all of these things are going to be, the trails, the bike paths, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Great, because I can see how that can work. But if it's done piecemeal, you know, what worries me about doing it piecemeal is that the economy can change, and that can change the what the at what the look of what you're doing changes. So do it. I mean, I'm one of those people that actually likes doing things in um, in um, what's the word I'm looking for um, stages. But this is going to be very complex because it, I mean, when I think about all the things you've got up there that you want to go into that you are thinking about putting into this uh, particular section. Um, things like, what, what I'm going to be wanting to look at is the architecturals, you know, do they blend? Are they actually taking a page off of what Rachel is saying? Does it look like this is a, this is a neighborhood? With all sorts of different things going on in the neighborhood, but it, they interact with each other. They speak to each other somehow or another. And then as we go to another section, another zone, how does that also connect? I think with something this big, that's the biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. I mean, specifically, there are going to be just thousands of challenges. But taking a look at this whole great big piece, as they each come up, how it ends up looking like it's one. We don't need five different things going on on this piece. We need the overall mm -hmm. sense of what it's about. Um, to this one in particular, um, I would like to see, and I'm willing with Rachel on workforce housing, make that a high priority for what happens here. And because I beat the bushes for this all the time, affordable housing, how can we actually plan? Isn't not a matter of, you know, oh yeah, we got to put some affordable housing in here. Right from the beginning. We have a requirement here for that. Right. And, and, and that it's going to have to be um, taken very seriously, and I'm sure it will be by the board. I'm excited about this. I think this is something that that, that Skyrim is ready for, and um, nobody can do it better than you guys. I just want to say, and I don't want to be too, too crazy about the time management, but <laughs> to sort of kind of keep things generally on track, we should probably move on to the phase one here in the next five minutes or so. And we're going to we'll cover a lot of but, this content. Um, and we'll get into some of those other details, but if anyone has any other comments based on what we've seen so far, go, go I, ahead. I, I was just wondering if, if you have any <coughs> vague notion of how many housing units you would build out when this is finally done. I don't think we do. Mm -hmm. Early. Um, it's hard to say right now. It really is. I mean, it depends on what the market's going to demand over time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we know we've got about 300 acres of developable land. Um, <coughs> you know what the zoning ordinance allows. I don't think we're going to get anywhere near it. Uh, I think in phase one we're looking at, what are we after? Between 120 and 140 units. Yeah. So we're going to be well under the... 20 units per acre that, that's allowed. But I, I think it's really hard to say because I, I can see areas that, you know, that it, if, if one type of use might might want it, they may be less residential or they could be more residential. It just depends on, really is going to depend on the market. That's why I think that if we set up our edges, um, and that's something Nick has really worked a lot on, looking at other parts of the country where it's been done before, you know, how do you how do you, you know, have some commercial use and then roll into uh, residential, or maybe allow that commercial use to keep coming if that's where the market wants to be, and then the, then the residential starts. We, we, we look at a lot of that, and we're trying to set ourselves up from day one that we can that we can allow that to happen. I, I know that about a 20-year build-out, you can't particularly 
Yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty, it's pretty it's good to say. Year 18, um, what you're gonna need. I think a lot of this is going to happen in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. But, you know, last time the shovel goes in the ground, yeah, it could, could be 20 years out. But I think, you know, we want to get to this, get to the center and, and get, to the, get to the good stuff, get to the things that the town really wants as soon as we can. Uh, and I think the, house, the housing stuff will kind of fill in and the as zoning, it's necessary. The zoning expects a, a balance of residential and commercial. So that's one of the responsibilities of us and the planning board is to report out to the council over time as master plans come in. Um, the trends of the project, and that's also why we're focused on phase one, but also phase two, and phase two being probably a commercial non-residential play um, off of Payne Road or Highgate Parkway. So we recognize that up front and want to come in early with with that balance and then continue to maintain that balance. You're talking the, a commercial or commercial and light industrial in phase two? We've talked about light industrial as a potential use, but it's not allowed right now in the zoning. So we're starting conversations about that being a potential fit off of Payne Road. But we didn't want to present that to you this evening as something that's not currently allowed. We want to kind of follow the right path on the process. So I'm, unless there's more comments, I'm happy to continue on so we can dig into the details of phase one. Are these like comments on the overall master plan yeah. type of thing? Oh, I yes. thought it was. Okay, excuse me. Because I, I tend to agree with the problem, the challenges and problematic sort of nature of doing this piecemeal. In addition to the architectural concerns that and, and sort of neighborhood flow concerns that have been expressed, I think um, it, there's also concerns from an environmental perspective um, that not all the wetlands have been delineated, which may play into your larger um, uh, layout and plan. As well as, I know that you've done some uh, National Historic Registry work. Has the entire site been done? Or the beginning with habitat and the endangered species? I, mm -hmm. I think you've got to do all that. And, and quite frankly, you know, the hydrology of the land. I, I, I don't necessarily, I'm not talking about the groundwater hydrology, but just the overall, where are you going to put things? I, I, I very much believe that the piecemeal approach is, is, is not going to serve you in the end. And it may not serve the town as well. So with that, let's go to phase one. Yeah. So I think yeah. I think in a lot of ways that's where the first review sort of started with that conceptual infrastructure plan to sort of start to articulate how these things might come together. But you know, when the zoning was put together, recognizing we're dealing with 500 acres or you know, total acres, um, that the, the next phase, this what we're moving into right now, identified that you know, really taking this at 50 acre increments was going to be you know, the likely scenario without um, you know, to be able to sort of identify likely to, you know, the, the, the overall infrastructure plan and site inventory that you had done previously sort of lays the general foundation for where things are going, but at each 50 acre increment is where it's envisioned that you do sort of the very specific site analysis. So are you saying but, the trains left the station on that? You know, I, I would say that the way, the way the ordinance is set up, that it's really envisioned that as part of this phase that we really drill into this 50 acres, now's the time to really figure out. So if, there's, if, there's, if the board felt there were missing pieces at site inventory, that was sort of the time to... And I think I did yep. mention that there mm -hmm. wasn't enough wetland information. Yeah. So I, I think, though, that, that we are looking at this holistically. And we are, you know, obviously this time of year we can't finish our wetlands. Uh, <clears> but, you know, we have looked at the... the piece that we want to talk specifically about, that has been looked at. Uh, Mark Hampton's done the wetlands, uh, DEP and Army Corps were on site, did a quick walk over with us. We're going to have a peer review that probably hasn't happened yet, but it's, you know, we're going to get hit with snow this week, but that's going to happen. Um, the rest of the parcel is, is you know, yeah. by, by summer will be done, but we're looking at all of the different infrastructures and all of the, you know, Lucas is thinking about drainage and globally. So we haven't just said, no, we're only looking at this. No, you know, I agree. We're talking about traffic on 
Payne Road and what those future phases might bring. So we're and these other ones aren't big ticket items either, Rocky. I mean, like all it takes is a, is is literally a letter yep. to to the I F and W to say screen the whole parcel for me. Yep. It's literally just yep. a letter. We had a meeting with the DW yep. and it's a whole and it's a letter stuff. to the National Historic Register saying do the whole parcel. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've done, but the beginning steps. with habitat is is really important to do the whole thing. So yep. I just. So when we talk about moving forward and having an explicit sort of approach to handling natural resources, I just, I want to, I'm going to assume then from now on that you all have characterized it appropriately. If we've moved past that and, and things are the way they are, then. Mm -hmm. I, I think it, it is worth noting the, the beach phase. So I think, I, I guess I didn't quite realize the level of specificity. <laughs> That's 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 that one. That's that's that one. <laughs> uh, how detailed you were looking to get, because I, I think as um, they were just sort of talking about with the site inventory, if I remember, right. there was a, a main historic preservation letter. Mm -hmm. Actually, there is one with this yep. packet yep. as well that talks about a grist mill that we'll probably be talking about here yeah. shortly, trying to find where that is. Yeah. Um, and I think if IFNW did, if I remember right, weigh yeah. in at site inventory. Um, very much on a high level, as you well know, those sort of maps are are at the state level, and so this is the time yeah, to and, really. And I think to satisfy mm -hmm. my concern, all I'd like to see is is this map that you have <coughs> under the sketch plan kind of a thing with all of these areas of concern labeled on there. Like we know that this is a wetland, so we know that we can't put stuff here, or we know that this is our national. So just take and put all that sort of like you know, mm -hmm. background information and say, just to remind us so that when we move forward in all future phases, if you could just have that on one map, just show us sure. mm -hmm. to remind we'll us. We're making progress on that every Yeah, time, so. exactly. I think that's going to get you 95% of the way there. So thank you. Yeah, yeah we, we either have most of that information right. or in the process of gathering right. it. So really a, some sort of constraints yeah. map. And it'll just save me from having to ask you 10 times. So thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> I've made a note. OK, thank you. Yeah, um, something Robin said just reminded me of something in the preliminary infrastructure plan for the um, phase one that I want to talk about while I remember it. Uh, and, and that is one of the things that you said in here is a distributed uh, stormwater management system is planned and will outlet to Mill Brook. And I guess it, as we get deeper into this plan, what I would like to know um, is that that you've really taken a look at what the impact would be on the, the water level of Millbrook and what that impact might be downstream. Because that's mm -hmm. part of problems that we're seeing mm -hmm. in developed areas as they develop more and more. The impact ripples down and folks who have been downstream for years all of a sudden find problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that's one of those things to, to take a look at, not just the, the impact um, the change in the water level, perhaps on Mill Brook, but what happens further down? Mm -hmm. As because of the size of the site, we do have to permit this through DEP and their site location. And, and do they the, look the whole site? Do they look not just the pipeline? But we, um, and as part of that, we do have to look at the uh, the flooding standard, which wouldn't wouldn't permit us to increase the. Um, the flow over the pre-development condition. So that's certainly something we'll be looking at. So on that note, I think it's very important that you work with staff to get staff in those pre-application meetings because a, a portion of that is going to be what you're calling existing impervious cover and what you're not. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I really want to rely on the, the expertise of staff here to be in those conversations with DEP with the flooding standard to make sure that what Rachel is saying is, is very much taken into account. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Well, right. This is a good segue because the next slide is go. about permitting. Um, <laughs> so kind of high level, and we've talked about this. We did our in conceptual infrastructure plan in January uh, where we looked at the entire site comprehensively from a natural resource and infrastructure standpoint. And so we're really at this second stage, as Jay outlined, where uh, we do look at large areas of the the property and seek approval for these 50 plus acre pods or master plans, which we'll present to you in more detail uh, later on. And then from that approval, 
Then we really drill into these details that we're, we're really starting to kind of foreshadow in terms of under subdivision, under site plan, under DEP stormwater permitting, Natural Resource Protection Act, Army Corps, where once we understand the rules of the game, which we need to lay down at master plan, then we can start designing. Uh, we don't want to jump ahead in design uh, very much without getting uh, consensus from the board on what are the zoning standards <coughs> to design with. So uh, that's the, the flow of the process, and it would be repeated at, at future phases um, under step two and three. So under phase one, um, we would have the plan development we're talking about tonight, and then subdivision site plan review. Um, it would trigger a main DEP stormwater permit, and we would have staff involved early in that process as, as recommended. Um, there, we'll show a little bit later, we have some minor wetland crossings to get from one upland to another, so that would trigger an NRPA permit and an Army Corps of Engineers uh, permit. Um, for future phases, so outside of master plan, after this first master plan, we would go through that same process, but given the size of the property and the, the significance of development, we would then also trigger <coughs> main DEP site law. Um, and that's a much more comprehensive process at the state level, which we're doing a lot of through this plan development process, but it would occur with the state. And then also we would be triggering and working a lot more on uh, traffic movement and the DOT traffic movement permit. So right now, phase one really is only gonna access route one, at least from an improvement standpoint. Trips <coughs> may kind of meander up to Payne Road and Hankus Parkway, but the improvements are towards route one. At future phases, we're gonna be working with staff and, and main DOT <coughs> and okay, what is the master plan for off-site improvements and how can how should those be phased over time with the various areas of development? And we want to start that conversation um, early with with DOT, so we have a good roadmap uh, moving forward after this this first phase. So, in terms of the site inventory, mm -hmm. these we saw these maps in our application and a few others, um, and this really kind of zoomed in on the natural resources. Um, on the site and the characteristics as well as the infrastructure that's around this first phase. Um, so, you know, one plan shows the existing tree cover and vegetated cover, which is, um, you know, it's been timber harvested uh, significantly over the years, but there's good buffers <coughs> to Mill Brook. So they didn't timber harvest near Mill Brook. There's good tree cover between uh, the Downs Road and Enterprise Business Park that meets the, the zoning's goal for a 50-foot buffer. Um, so those are assets that are in place in terms of trees and vegetative cover. <coughs> we also have uh, the, the soil conditions out there, the wetlands uh, delineated for um, this phase and beyond. And, um, and also we've mapped out, okay, what are the accessible uplands close to the Downs Road? What are the inaccessible uplands that um, are really on the wrong side of the stream and, and not useful and, and to be developed as part of this phase one. We've also looked closely and Lucas has been working on for quite some time on, okay, the infrastructure uh, system around the site and how we best plug into it. We've talked about sewer a bit. We also have a plan for water, electric. Um, we're actually working with the fiber optic folks um, with connections through uh, Karen and Tom to, to try to get fiber into this, this property, which could be a great asset to the town and to residents and businesses that ultimately um, are in this in the project. So to kind of dive into <coughs> phase one, we've talked actually a fair amount about it already, um, but this kind of gets into some of those elements. This is what we submitted um, to the planning board in our application. This, shows the proposed master plan for for phase one and you know some of the key elements um, from a natural resource standpoint are you know we're proposing a hundred foot buffer <coughs> to Millbrook um, as and Millbrook is mapped as actually a brook trout stream so we got that information from the state as part of our outreach and we want to provide provide that additional stream buffer to Mill Brook. 
which is shown on the plan um, going from the state-owned land to the east down, down the site. Um, and then kind of behind the Comfort Inn and then across Route 1. So this is Millbrook here with a, with a buffer on the development side and then um, <coughs> as well as on the, on the opposite side of the stream. There's, uh, we're also planning for 25 foot wetland buffers and setbacks to all the development areas or pods. And you can see there's the land really kind of lays out in five different kind of development areas. Um, this is the largest one here at about seven and a quarter, seven and a half acres. Um, we'll kind of detail that out a little bit more in terms of what's envisioned there. And then this area here is where we, uh, there's kind of three different upland pods where we're crossing the, proposing to cross the wetlands at their narrowest locations to create that single family neighborhood that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, there's also some development potential we're showing down closer to Enterprise Business Park on the other side of the Downs, the Downs Road. Um, in terms of open space, we're anticipating um, about 25 acres of open space. I don't know why it says feet there, but 25 acres of open space, which is more than 40% of this um, of this phase one. Some other kind of key design <coughs> elements, really more about streets and um, streets and public infrastructure. We really want this first phase to have. Uh, a really appealing, kind of welcoming gateway. So we're thinking about a kind of a landscape boulevard coming in from Route 1, having a center island, having uh, a really nice streetscape uh, coming into the project before you get to development. Um, there is a nice stand of trees separating the road, the current Downs Road from Enterprise. We want the, to maintain those and create a good buffer from the adjacent development. We're designing to the extent that kind of natural resources allow interconnected streets. So we want to do a kind of a loop road here. Um, and the next plan shows this being a loop road at staff's recommendations. And we very much agree. We looked at this initially. Um, but I've updated the master plan to have a kind of a connected street here. Um, do you contemplate any interconnections with Enterprise itself? We are, um, and staff uh, suggested we think about a, a four-way interconnection here. The re we actually looked at that a fair amount, um, and a future slide shows some potential for at least a pedestrian connection there, maybe a, a road or driveway connection. The reason we've laid it out this way is really to enable kind of more of a contiguous multifamily area here where we can incorporate the common or green with the multifamily buildings. So just design-wise so far, this is laid out a bit better for housing and for kind of sense of place to shift the road and not have a four-way intersection. We still want to have that strong connection enterprise, but don't know that there's going to be a lot of trips that are directly you know, enterprise to this project to residents. So we feel like, you know, left and a right uh, probably still provides connectivity and maybe sets up the development design of that pot a little bit better. But um, so that's really kind of an overview of, of this layout. We, and this kind of zooms in on our early concept um, that helps um, better describe kind of what we're thinking. And um, so from a kind of more of a sense of development pattern and um, layout, mix of uses, this is, a, again, an early concept. What we're thinking about is, as Rocky described a little bit earlier, uh, a mix of potentially kind of duplex, more um, you know, senior focused, single living type dwellings down in this area, um, in that kind of horseshoe shaped uh, lower pod. Um, those could be good empty nester housing or, or other. Uh, we're thinking about 
kind of two or three story housing along the Downs Road. Uh, this scenario contemplates townhouses. We've also looked at kind of eight unit um, or multifamily type housing that's two or two and a half story, but has that kind of more of that vertical uh, development to kind of create create that kind of sense of place coming into the project and to provide some housing diversity um, in this area. We're talking to a non-residential use uh, user here that could be assisted living kind of memory care type use um, that we think fits the residential character of this area. It would be a small scale facility that they want to be in a neighborhood, a mixed neighborhood, so it could be a real natural fit in this area, and then up in the more northerly pod, this is where kind of Rocky mentioned um, some multifamily housing, and then feathering into a more of a single family type neighborhood. Um, and based on this layout, based on what the zoning allows for, um, we're thinking about you know a range of eight to 12 units per acre overall. That's going to be, you know, denser in the multifamily areas and, and lower density than that in the single family. And the duplexes would be somewhere in between. The zoning allows 20 units per acre, um, respecting the natural resources and trying to kind of commute, create that neighborhood feel. We want it to be compact and active, but not, not too dense, not kind of too urban for this initial phase. Um, some other kind of design elements, we're looking a lot at how do we create a pocket neighborhood, pocket park, or kind of commons, particularly in, in this area. We've looked at it, I think, uh, six ways to Sunday, <laughs> and we're kind of narrowing in on some ideas that we want to present to the board at a, at a future meeting um, as soon as we can. We think we have a couple good ideas to, to kind of run with and progress. Um, where units actually kind of back up to this common and have, you know, whether it's front porches or back porches, engage with the common and be that kind of gathering, kind of neighborhood focal point that you were talking about, Rachel. Um, and all the units in that project could use it, regardless of whether they're actually fronting it or they're having pedestrian and sidewalk connections to it. Um, we've been looking a lot at trails. Uh, we don't have all the trail system figured out, but we want to connect the various pods of development to each other um, where possible. And we also, as soon as the snow melts a little bit more, we want to figure out the best connection to the state property to the east. And we're thinking a lot about how do we do a trail connection up to the rest of the project, not necessarily just following the road. There's timber harvesting that's occurred over the years that's created some swaths that we think we could potentially use as a multi-use path and also do some kind of wetland restoration in the process. Um, so that's a key component that we're continuing to work on. Um, and jump in anytime, guys, if I'm missing anything there. I'll keep rolling to stay on, on task. Um, as Jay outlined, one of the biggest kind of pieces of planning board action um, with the master plan stage is coming up with a specific zoning standards to enable our collective kind of goals for this phase. So to create kind of more of that compact neighborhood, we're looking at small lots. Um, and so on single and duplex lots, you know, given that we're thinking of either in this phase or future phases to, to do kind of more of the alley loaded housing like Eastern Village and Dunstan have done, not necessarily just like their projects, but that philosophy. Um, there's some kind of unique zoning that you need to, to do that. Um, having small lots that can, can have small lot areas, but then share common open space, we think is a good balance. So we're proposing you know, 2,500 square foot lots um, to enable that. And also can enable some flexibility on whether it's a condominium form of ownership or individually owned lots. The development design would be the same, but there just may be lot lines instead of common common ownership. That's a piece of the, the puzzle there. Um, we're proposing a bit larger lots for multifamily and townhouse, but still small, compact lots. 
Um, because of the potential for a pocket neighborhood, we're requesting to not have a frontage requirement because that would enable units like this to not have a lot frontage on a street and again be accessed by shared alleys and then really kind of their frontage is is fronting a park that they share in common. Um, we may not end up with that design here, but it creates flexibility to kind of create that neighborhood that um, we've been talking about. The same kind of thing around having the buildings close to the street, having kind of stoops, walkways down to the sidewalk, front porches that can be right up close to the sidewalk. Uh, we're proposing kind of zero frontage. Eastern Village has that same uh, allowance where the units engage with the street and then maybe have more private backyards or have that um, common pocket park. In terms of side yards, um, that's where we are proposing five foot side yards um, and that's to create some separation between the units and also to meet um, the fire department's requirements for, for separation for unsprinkler buildings. So that's directly consistent with what, what they expect in some other zones, and that's where we came up with that, that standard. Um, just to kind of round out our presentation, this is just a quick run through on addressing some of staff's comments and having a conversation with the board about them. Um, on affordable housing, we understand the, and certainly support the 10% requirement and we've been thinking a lot about that, and um, we're very prepared to provide um, the affordable units at 80% of AMI as, as rental units, and the town is, has their system set up for rental in terms of how that needs to be um, monitored and administered year to year and documented, and Rocky's working um, with Jay and, and, and Tom and the Town Housing Alliance on that for Carrier Woods. So there's a good system in place for that. And for a phase of this size, we're thinking it's around 13 units, um, 12 to 14 really, depending on uh, the subdivision review process and total number of units. There's a question about open space and the ownership of open space. Um, we're anticipating multiple layers of homeowners associations or master associations for the project. This early phase would have a homeowners association for maintenance of the pocket parks and those common sort of active green spaces. Um, the same could be true in terms of the conservation land. We also want to reserve the potential for kind of a land trust or a conservation partner long term from the bigger picture. There's we're planning for meaningful open space in the project overall. So it may make sense to work with Scarborough Land Trusts, um, Portland Trails, a group like that on the overall project. Talk, this plan shows that street looping recommended by staff and we've updated it accordingly. Um, I talked a bit about that enterprise connection, but, but this shows how there could be kind of a connection to enterprise, but also the road alignment in a slightly different location for that area. Um, and we're committed to trail connections to the surrounding area, particularly the state property to the east. We just need some time to map that out to get the right alignment. Um, I think the only, the other things that were raised that we just want to touch on, exceptional tree specimens. Um, we've in analyzing the trees and the resources in this area, really the, the best trees are along the stream corridor and along that buffer to Enterprise. The uplands and even the wetlands to the north have been cut fairly hard. There are some larger specimen trees. Um, we haven't inventoried them in our development areas, just really given the compact nature that we're proposing. We don't anticipate project that's going to you know, going to be spread out enough to save trees that are going to be viable in longer term. We'd rather focus on the wetland, the wetland buffers, the buffers to enterprise than trying to save a few pines sort of in the core of the uplands. So that's really why we've asked for that waiver is it's 
you know, it's likely hard, at least in these closer development areas to, to the downs, to save a few trees in the development areas. Um, transit service, big picture, is very much on our radar. We've thought a lot about how to how this project can plug into the transit system. So we want to look at the transit stop and where that makes sense in this early phase. If not, put it in in, in the early phase, have a place for it so that it can go in when the transit providers think the project's worthy to be served. And um, I think, Robin, you mentioned groundwater hydrology. Um, we're on the cusp of doing test pits for understanding hydrology in this first phase one. We really just want to get our layout down enough to know where to do test pits for, for stormwater management. And we want to do them you know, where it makes sense for that distributed stormwater system. So we're, I think we're a week or two away from conducting those test pits to, to do the groundwater hydrology for this part of the master plan. So that's really our presentation. And uh, we want to get your feedback on, on phase one. Um, like I said, this evening we want to kind of continue to work, work through this plan development review. Um, we're interested in approval simply to get into the details that I think you are interested in. The, the, the fun part is the subdivision layout, the site plan, the, how we kind of put this master plan to work, um, which would be our really our next step in the process through subdivision and site plans. And we also want to kind of get the kinks out with you in this master planning process for the next version, because we, we want to get in the right kind of rhythm and process with you, because we anticipate coming back with phase two. And we want it to be kind of predictable for you and get you the information you need and package it the right way so that um, you know we're we're providing what you need and we can kind of work together on progressing through the next phases as well. So thanks for a chance to present phase one. Thank you. And um, at this point, I'll open open it back up for public comment. If anyone's interested, come on up and. Just introduce yourself, give your address, just grab right up, right up the podium. For Dan. Dan will yield. Oh, good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I've been hogging this for a long time. My name's Larry Howell. I live at, at 9 Period and Drive. Um, I'm neither here to, to support it or be against it. I'm a lay person. I work in banking and compliance and so forth, so I'm totally out of my element here. I came to learn stay engaged in this process because it is a very large process, uh, project and certainly important to our, 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 our town. It sound, so I just got these impressions tonight. So um, it sounds like the master plan was approved in January for the whole site, but now we're talking about master plan for the various phases. Right, that was what, what was what was approved in January was, and it can be a little bit hard to follow even for those of us who are on the board <laughs> when it comes to these things. That was what we call the kind of site inventory, okay. where it was basically a very broad, look, as the name suggests, inventory, that sort of a review of what's there, what what basically getting the lay of the land. We didn't really approve any type of development per se or anything like that. It was just basically the board acknowledging that, you know, we've got a general lay of the land and we kind of know what's generally buildable, what's not buildable, what some of the constraints and opportunities are. Um, and so now this is this would be the first action board action that would potentially set the stage for an actual phase being developed and we would still move on as has been alluded to to having <clears throat> more specific subdivision and site plan review processes where we really drill down at a, at a very detailed level on, on some of the dimensional things and and a lot of the other details that we typically look at when we do a site site review. Okay, it was just simply using the phrase master plan approval and then master plan for phase one. It's like, okay, there's, there's a nuance here somewhere on what, what those mean. Um, at, at the outset, we compared it with Freeport's downtown and Portland downtown and, and the development out of Cape Cod. I think hopefully that was just to show uh, the physical size, because this certainly is not going to look like uh, the commercial 
development in downtown Freeport. It's not going to be a town center. I mean, that phrase has been thrown around, town center um, concept, and I think there's probably as many meanings as our people in town. Um, and interconnected, we've heard that phrase a lot, not just tonight, but other times during the comprehensive planning stages. Um, it physically is removed from this downtown area, but I, I understand it being connected within the development. Um, economic engine, um, a little concerned there because of, I'm concerned only because of this is a very large housing project conceptually. Uh, you know, we've talked tonight around 100 and somewhat um, dwellings or, or units in this first phase, which represents just 50 acres. And when you take a look at the north quadrant over there, uh, there's certainly going to be a lot more. Uh, that certainly has an impact on the community. There was a big, long, drawn-out discussion last spring on the um, uh, top end uh, apartment houses being built out on Payne Road, the 288, and the impact that was going to have on the town. And that's a high-end one, looking at, at uh, incomes of $100,000 and so forth and a lot of concern about what impact that was going to have on the schools and so forth. Here we have a totally different development, and as certainly everyone at this table knows, uh, if I have a house that's worth 300000 I have two kids in school, I'm a negative to the community. I'm not paying enough in property taxes to cover the, the $12,000 per child. So that's certainly a, a concern on something this large. Uh, street, I saw in, in the plan where the street width where they're talking about 20 foot wide street lengths and street parking. And so, again, as a layperson, it's like those fire trucks we have are pretty darn large. I don't know how you know they would maneuver through the streets like that. Um, I guess it was in the leader I saw where uh, there was a suggestion that maybe restaurants with drive ups in them, which would be our McDonald's or our Wendy's gas station. Um, retail shopping centers, that is a gone by here. I mean, we have so much uh, space available in Scarborough and South Portland for retail space that uh, needs to be redeveloped. So, just uh, like I said, just some thoughts off the off the head of a, a lay person that's trying to understand the process. Thank you. We appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Anyone else? Going once. Okay. So we'll turn back to board discussion. Question. I wasn't here for the first um, go around on this, so I'm sure the answer is obvious to anybody who was here. But when we started, we looked at five different phases. So those are those are established. In other words, we're just looking at phase one. Phase two, when it's time, will be the phase two that you showed us. I mean, in other words, I'm trying to figure out what, what changes around here and what doesn't. Um, these are all going to connect to each other, so I just want to make sure that the phases are not going to change without there being some mm -hmm. serious input from all the various and sundry boards and so on. I'm correct. So if I might, Susan, just to help with that, so as... This whole master plan. Right. Thing, the, it's the, 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 I got the, you. The <laughs> yeah, I'm going to try, try to help with it because a lot of those language is very similar in many ways. As Corey alluded to, what the board action so far has mm -hmm. been is to do the site inventory and the conceptual infrastructure plan. And right. I can pull it, but that, that's really what the board approved. And it was really about how are the, so in that, embedded in there is how are the streets going to connect sort of from the site out to the neighborhood, out to the community, but also internally, generally. How are, how are we going to bring in um, uh, 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 other infrastructure, water and sewer lines? Where are those going to come from outside the site? But once they get in the site, how are they going to sort of articulate around in there? How are trails going to connect? Oh, I understand. Um, and so that was approved. Now what they're asked to do, required to do, is to do a mas to do master plan on at least 50 acres. And so right now they're talking about five master plans. Something could happen tomorrow that they have eight master plans. There, there is no overarching 
as approved master plan. The board's not being asked to approve the overall master plan that they're showing. Right now, that they're they're generally giving us their best bet, and I, you know, no reason to doubt they don't think these are the five phases it's going to develop in. But right now, that could change, and it's it's really just trying to provide context for this first phase. So, at, but as as I think Dan mentioned, you know, they're looking at. They don't know how the trails are going to sneak through these neighborhoods to connect to the other, the rest of the development area, but that's part of what this board can do with this phase is to say, okay, we, you know, we, we have a boundary for this 50 acres, but like the board has done with uh, rural subdivisions that has a dead end road, you can say, well, give us a 50 foot wide right away. We don't know exactly what's going to happen at that jutting. A budding property, but we have a pretty good idea it's going to develop, and we're going to want an interconnected road. So, if you sort of think about it in that context, but we do have at least a general, a general map. Uh, I don't even know if map. Uh, a general direction we're trying to head, and that's what that site inventory and conceptual infrastructure plan provided. It might be helpful. I, I think where the confusion nope. comes from. I'm sorry, but nope, I ahead. get it. I get it. Good. But I think that part of the confusion comes from when we talk about a conceptual master plan. Mm -hmm. When I think of a conceptual master plan, I think of the whole thing. And there's mm -hmm. a conceptual master plan. And we've got five proposed today, five phases in this conceptual. But now we're talking about the conceptual master plan for phase one. And it gets really, it gets <coughs> naughty in terms of trying to figure out exactly where we are. But I think I get it. Um, I'm perfectly honest. If this was being done by people I didn't know, if this was being done from people from away, I would have a very different attitude towards where we are right now with this. I would want to know that what you presented to me at the beginning of five phases was the conceptual plan. And we would hold you to it. And if things come along where phase one and phase three don't really blend, then you have to come back to the board and change your master plan. But I get what it is you're saying you want to do, and I trust the fact that you, we know how to find you. Um, it's not going to be a real problem. But there is something about presenting this mm -hmm. that needs to be cleaned up in how you how you refer to it, because it really took me, and I haven't been I've been hanging around here a few years, and it really got me very confused. So we, it was kind of double-edged sword to show you all of this information. I know. We we're really not required to show it to you, but we thought it made sense to show you that we are thinking about this globally. This is where we think we're headed. The important things are, you know, we want mixed neighborhoods. We know we want different yeah. uses. We know we want a walkable neighborhood. We know we want, you know, mm -hmm. interconnected trails. Uh, we want to connect, you know, to other areas that are natural resources. So that's really the the, the reason we showed you the whole the whole thing. We weren't trying to confuse anybody. No, no, no I'm not we're not. That. And and I and I want to say, we need the flexibility. We we don't want to be locked in because we need that flexibility. We don't know what's going to happen over time. So we've got to be building something that everybody wants here. We I don't want to build something that nobody I wants. I understand, and I'm still talking about how confusing it is. I think if you took the word master out, conceptual plan phase one. OK. But it, uh, one thing I might suggest that might be helpful, I think Dan had asked sort of, how can you package this as these come along? I think one thing we might want to look at, Dan, Tell me if I'm going astray here, but like I said, the board did approve a, a overall conceptual infrastructure plan. It might be helpful if we take that plan and then put the pods. Right. Uh, take, That's a very good Take idea. this pod and put it on that plan. Okay. Once this is approved, then you come in with the next pod. It, yep. Much like you did sort of with the overlays with Portland and Mashpee Common. You know, rather than doing helpful. that, you're just laying. Okay. It might just help I think be very put it helpful. in context. Because that was back in January, and the board has seen, you know, 30 other things since then. So, thank you. We can talk I'm, about, I'm, but yeah, is that is that sort of the? That makes sense. Okay. That's, that that would be very helpful. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Rachel? Yeah, um, I want to emphasize the connection, the importance of the connection to Enterprise Drive, because it's, I think that the. Um, the housing mix that you're putting in there, and I know what's on Enterprise Drive, um, a daycare center. Uh, so people don't have to drive out to Route 1 in summer traffic and then around and then 
you know, go three quarters of a mile when a quarter of a mile will get them there. Uh, there's a daycare center, there's the storage unit coming in, there's a, a vets, um, there's medical buildings, uh, my dentist. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff right there already that would be very attractive to the people right. who are moving in. Um, so I do think that's important. I'm having difficulty visualizing some of the things that you're talking about. So when you say 2,500 square feet, no frontage, five feet here, um, I, I'm just not clear on the scale. So I don't know if you have pictures of developments or housing units that roughly reflect what you're talking about so I can see it in context. Mm -hmm. If there's some place that I should go and drive up and down streets because what's in that development is something that you're talking about. That would be very helpful for me when you bring your plans. Mm -hmm. So I can see how, what, what it means mm -hmm. when you say mm -hmm. no frontage. Uh, or a, an alleyway in the garage and you, you walk it into mm -hmm. the back, that sort of stuff. Sure. That would, kind of like with the overlay, that would, be, that would be helpful. That sort of visualization because you're talking really about something different. How about if we brought you pictures of the actual design? So a street level view that actually showed what? I think I died and gone to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, would, that would help as long as I have a context of something that helps me in terms of context of size and distance and sometimes mm -hmm. a, an actual picture helps a little more or driving around a neighborhood that is kind of like what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's helpful to me. Right. Sure. Well, I mean, Eastern Village, um, we're going to do wider roads. We'll see that front. But um, you know, that's a hot button item. <laughs> yeah. Right. Eastern um, Village, which road should I drive down? That, that sort of we can road. give you um, destinations within the project, but the general character of the project in terms of the building's relationship to the sidewalk is <laughs> zero to five foot setbacks to give you a sense for how the buildings address the street. There's a little area in that project that actually is arranged around a park um, that those lots don't have frontage. Um, they front a park. park. So street that's frontage. it. That's not on the park. Right. Yes. They don't have street frontage. Yes. But street frontage, we're talking about street frontage. Correct. Sorry. Typically yeah. is what um, you're talking about. So not exactly the same project or same vision. So then coupling maybe a field trip there with what <coughs> Nick can produce in terms of fly throughs yeah. and that I, I need that I need that yeah. I need to be able to visualize it. Mm -hmm. It's part it's kind of part of our design process too, is we we like to model things and measure things and and really understand what we're designing in three D. So if we can if we can outpour a you know or output a a visual that gives you a, a clear, realistic sense of what it is that we're designing, then. Yeah. The we're asking for something that's different. I mean, it, we, we don't have any set, you know, you must have this many lineal feet of street frontage, and you must have this many feet of setback to that frontage, or we don't, we don't have those things here. We're asking for a lot of flexibility. Uh, but I think it's going to allow us to do something. And that's why it helps me to see how it works in, mm -hmm. in other places. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to make clear as a as kind of a procedural note that, um, that if and when we approve this phase one master plan, we will be approving those setbacks and all, all those, right. everything that is laid out there. So to the extent that folks feel like they need more information or they need to see examples or need to get a better sense of, of that, then I think we're talking about probably extending this conversation to at least hopefully just one more uh, meeting, whether it's done in a, as part of a regular board meeting or another workshop. Um, I personally am not seeing anything that that really concerns me and seems like a deal killer in terms of the in terms of the plan. And there's a lot of great stuff here, um, and I I like the fact that you know that the applicants acknowledged the, the comments that have been brought up to this point, including connectivity and scale and mixed use and affordable housing, and being really specific about that. Um, I think you know they're going to be, as there always are, a lot of devils in the details in terms of design, architecture, particularly when we talk about, we get to the point where we're talking about single family homes because unlike 
multifamily, we don't get to see those individual proposals as those are as those are built. So we're going to, you know, want to make sure that that um, we have a good sense of that architectural sensibility in terms of porches and fenestration and things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to. Well, I, I just that. hope I just yeah. you know, kind of asking for them to to be ready as we start to really dig in yeah. that that that's in, yeah. in the design that. Right. I think having that would help. I agree, and I think, and that's as was alluded to. You know, the the overlays that we did, um, and I appreciate the comment about, and that, uh, and I think Dan mentioned this during the initial presentation that by doing those, by overlaying the footprint on those different communities, was by no means to suggest that the applicant intends to develop in that way. But um, I think we've found that sometimes it helps folks to get their heads around scale, just to you know, because you, you hear acreage rattled off and I think particularly a site like this where people have kind of cut through a portion of it uh, they may not have a sense of what the how big it is and how much how much potential is really there so I think it's 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 a similar it's a similar notion just kind of getting a sense of scale and something that people can relate to mm -hmm. I'd like to touch on that really quickly yeah. if you don't mind I think the most important one was the one that we showed uh, laid over the Portland Peninsula oh yeah that was great and you know not that we can do anything like that. It's not what we're thinking about, but it's a sense of scale. And it, to me, you start to think about what are the different uses in that space that's happening right on that peninsula. And some of those uses go really well together, and maybe some don't. You know, the city's made a lot of changes over the years, but if you think about all the different things that happen mm. in that space. Sorry, that's a lot of impervious cover. Oh, <laughs> no, that's not, no, not, that's not happening. And that's, that's not my point. Right. He, gave, he gave a pretty strong disclaimer. He did give yeah. a strong yeah. disclaimer, but, but I think that could be the potential deal breaker, which is if you're looking at a 25 square, you know, about a 2,500 square foot lot, and you you got to make only 75% of that can be impervious, and you want the front porch to go right up to the street, and you got a back alley, and you got all this, so. Mm -hmm. No, I, I see what yeah. you're saying about mixed use, but uh, we don't want that impervious cover in Scarborough right now, do we? Mm -hmm. I get that. Do we? Mm -hmm. Nope. No, there's no okay. question. Uh, absolutely not. Yeah. Get that. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyone else? So where are we? Probably not the best time to schedule a sidewalk. <laughs> <laughs> not tomorrow. Yeah. Two feet of snow coming, yeah. bothering you. Or? Wet snow. We are I just uh, actually on that. I, I will just reference, and this might get back to an earlier question as well. Uh, I know I think Jamel's been trying to coordinate with uh, our wetland peer reviewer to get out there. And we're sort of coming up on vernal pool time mm -hmm. as well. So we may want to actually have a conversation about phase two, of mm -hmm. what you're thinking right now mm -hmm. as phase two, maybe doing both now rather than sort of you guys coming back in August with phase two. We no, say, no, what I, about I the vertical pool study? That definitely, so definitely makes we, sense. We, we had a conversation with Mark Hampton the other day, yeah. and I said, look, as soon as you can, you know, you can go. Mm. Yeah. Now we've got snow coming, so it's right. going to push it it's off good. a few weeks. But still, but, we're, I mean, we're on the. But typically, those morning so. pool studies are done in that yeah. early to mid-April time frame. It's yep. a pretty tight window, and so if we're so going to we have someone get, go out, we, we can want really to get that done. We want to get yep. the peer review done as well. So, because we, we know we need to have it. Right. right. So. Yeah. And I know we all appreciate the applicant, as developers always do. There's always in times of the essence, and we get that. Um, at the same time, we want to make sure we do it right and we don't want to feel like we're rushing things. I think it'll benefit everyone down the road to make sure that we've mm -hmm. gone through it deliberately and have a good comfort level. So, so being tonight we're being asked to uh, to vote. We're not I think well, where we where we've landed is we we need we need some more information, okay. some more context in terms of those setbacks and so okay. forth. But the concept uh, right. Something really positive. It's very, very exciting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think you know we'll, we'll come back to you. Hopefully at the next meeting or whatever we move on. Put on agenda. I know you do have some heavy agendas, but uh, uh, come back to you and, and talk about this. And, and we probably would be at a point where we could start to talk about a little more meat and potatoes on on phase one. Uh, so maybe you know maybe we could get approval, master plan approval at the next meeting, and then also have some time that we could talk about really more detail on 
on phase one. But I think I think we, you know, Nick can pull some information together, and I, I think you can get pretty comfortable with what we're asking for. Right. And I think details good. on phase one can help inform space and bulk and vice versa. So it, it's kind Good. of a natural mm -hmm. combination. Okay. I think along with space and bulk, the architectural design, so will be yep. clutch to the next meeting as well. Yep. I, I heard that loud and clear from several yeah. board members. Sure. Just instinctively, from what that last go back and forth here, I think that maybe another meeting like this is going to be more productive than trying to fit that into our regular, yeah. um, you know, bulk space and bulk. And I mean, it's like mm -hmm. I just had to put that out there to staff. To, okay. It's been very helpful to sort of give and take. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, mm -hmm. and as a volunteer, I mean, this is this is very important. I think to us to to understand because. This is a very important, this is a landmark project mm -hmm. for the town, and I think it, it, I'm willing to put the extra time in outside of the planning board to do that. I was going to say, it is extra yeah. time on your part. We do yeah. appreciate you doing this tonight. I, I, I do think we could make a lot of progress if we had another one. Productive. Uh, I'd like great. to make just make one closing comment. Um, it's really great that you guys are talking about, I can't remember if it was Lucas or Nick who was looking into other um, housing projects sort of, and I don't mean housing projects, I mean other developments mm -hmm. around the country. Um, but I, I think it's really important. One of the things that we talk about at Palooza was how do, we, how do we keep our millennial kids here? Mm -hmm. And as somebody who has a millennial kid whose kid can't afford to live here, um, maybe she's a boomerang kid, no big deal, right? Um, but, Let's think about what's what is attracting the millennials. You know, we talked about how they like to have, you know, minimal carbon footprint and you know mm -hmm. tiny houses and you know we do have the opportunity to think outside the box. So mm -hmm. so let's let's think and get really creative of, of what has been really successful yeah. throughout the country. You know, like and I know Dan, you brought up the mash pee example, but not necessarily that we want it to be retail. But as far as neighborhoods and that sense of community is mm -hmm. concerned, I think we have a real mm -hmm. tremendous opportunity here to look. 20, 20 years from now, what's the neighborhood of the future going to look like? And I think we've got to all put our brains into that mm -hmm. perspective. And I can promise you to do that if you guys can do that for us, too, and we bring can us do some it. visuals. Mm -hmm. good. Yeah, speak, that's some pretty good, uh, yeah. pretty good homework, for sure. Yeah. It's very exciting. Yeah. I remember back when the first opportunity to talk about um, uh, Great American Neighborhood type things came up, and the, the, the response was, people aren't going to want to live like that. It's not going to work. People aren't going to people aren't going to buy a house with no land. Mm -hmm. And how long did it take? Right, like no time at all. And here we are talking about something that's going to be like, you know, 10, 15, 20 years down. It's a great opportunity to think big, mm -hmm. to think change. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a yeah. that's the beauty of planning and urban design is that you know nothing happens. We might we're, we're designing today, mm -hmm. but we have to design for tomorrow Absolutely. or five years from now. Yeah. So, well, yeah. thanks for. And I appreciate the feedback too. As a designer, it's, it's important to get get the feedback. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you all, and thanks thanks for the comments from from the public. And uh, there will be more opportunities for public comment as as is our custom as we go through and get through specific phases of development. So, um, more bites at the apple. So, unless there are other comments, I'll move to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor. Thanks. I think he didn't say a word. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.